Yeah, I'm here. <clears throat> Can you thank hear me? Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for inviting. Oh, of course. It's yeah. good to see you again. All right, and Nate Cass is on. You guys ready? Yes. Okay, Dr. O'Malley may join us in a little while. And Dr. Cassetti, unfortunately, had a last minute obligation. So I don't think she is gonna be able to make it. I think she's tied up in the operating room. Okay, so we talked about this before. You guys have probably seen these slides hundreds of times, as my guess. Um, certainly our audience has seen uh, some variation of this slide uh, today, but it's such a critical point um, uh, in making constructing an argument for the endoscope over the microscope. Um, so just to reiterate very briefly, with a microscope, that one of the perceived disadvantages is that we're constricted, right, by the narrowest part of the ear canal. Uh, and of course, there are some patients who have very wide ear canals. There are some who have very narrow ear canals, large anterior canal bulges and exostoses, whatever it is. Uh, with an endoscope, fortunately, there, we can bypass some of those um, obstacles and get a much wider view of the uh, structures of the middle ear that we're most interested in seeing. So, you know, with that consideration in mind, we'll kind of get into um, uh, our first topic of conversation, which is how do you manage the subtotal tympanic membrane perforation? So let's pretend that you see a patient like this in clinic. Uh, Numan, Dr. Mansour, uh, tell, us, tell us how you think about um, how to approach this. And uh, maybe if you can talk to us about what you're, what you're most interested in hearing from the patient about historical details and how you think about um, whether to reconstruct, how to reconstruct, and uh, some of the technical details of the operation for you. Sure. So um, I think in this kind of situation, um, you know, you'll obviously take a basic uh, history. You want to know the chronicity of their problem. <clears throat> so for how long they've had this problem, how long they've known this perforation, um, and then I think the most important question is uh, uh, about drainage or recurrent drainage, okay? Because uh, if this is a chronic uh, draining year instead of a dry perforation, then the management is different. If it's a chronically draining year, uh, then I'm worried mainly not about the perforation, but also about the status of the mastoid. And I think in those cases, um, you know, of course, in any otologic problem, you'll have an audiogram uh, that will also give you some information. Um, but again, in, in this situation, probably one of the most, most important thing would be to ensure whether this is a dry perforation, a dry middle ear cleft versus a chronically draining problem. The other thing, <clears throat> of course, is the, the other side, like do they have pervasive eustachian tube issues or not? Uh, because if they do have a pre-existing or underlying eustachian tube issue and you do a beautiful tympanoplasty, uh, what will happen is that over a period of time, they may develop a recurrent effusion. Um, and mostly, most of us, I think, uh, I, um, I was looking at your talk. I, I think for this kind of uh, perforation, I would also use a composite cartilage graft. And, um, and you don't want to be in a situation where there's a effusion sitting underneath a cartilage graft and causing significant hearing loss. Um, so that's how would, I would basically think about it. Uh, the audiogram will be also uh, revealing because, uh, you know, if there's an underlying acicular issue, all right, the IS joint integrity, things like that, you can glean some insights from the audiogram, uh, but that's the basic way to start. Yeah, that was a great explanation. So what about you, Dr. Cass? Yeah, in, in my mind, there's, uh, there's three main reasons to fix a perforation. Uh, there's significant conductive hearing loss that's bothersome and that you think that you can actually help. Uh, there is um, a desire to um, make sure that they are able to not have a draining ear. And then there's um, water precautions. So people that really want to be able to be in the water and uh, find that, that uh, frequent water exposure is causing um, drainage issues. Uh, that's probably the third and, and fix. And then the other reasons would be if you needed to be closed for another procedure, such as a stapes or, or a CI. So um, <clears throat> I guess I'd be interested in knowing how old this patient is, um, what their concerns are. Uh, you know, if this is a person that has a dry perforation, they've had it for 20 years, 
they have good hearing the other side. They use a hearing aid in this year. Um, you know, they 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 get along just fine. They coming to you because they have popping or crackling or something. That's a very different story than someone that said that's 20 years old uh, and has a has a good other ear. Um, that that you feel like you're really going to be able to help a lot uh, with this for, for with a surgery for this problem. So I think the first thing we have to do always is, is figure out how we can help the patient, not necessarily, um, you know, what approach we'd use for some surgery that may or may not even need to happen. No, that's an excellent point. I think um, uh, it, you brought up a lot of great points about water exposure. You know, that it's it's um, it's perhaps a very different conversation if you are um, talking to an individual who is who has say you know uh, a perfectly functioning other ear on the other side this this is a dry ear uh, and they've gone you know years decades uh, with no problem uh, with this ear maybe this perf was um, incidentally detected on an exam by a primary care physician uh, and the patient had no uh, otorrhea or issues whatsoever. Uh, that patient has been used to having a hearing loss in this in this ear for for quite some time, and is perfectly happy with it. It's hard it's hard to imagine you know committing a patient like that to an operation and uh, you know pushing them toward it uh, as opposed to somebody say who um, with a chronically draining ear every time they get, have the ear exposed to water. Uh, and somebody who really enjoys doing water activities, say scuba diving or what, what, whatever it is. Um, for that patient, you know, you can see that there's probably going to be some uh, significant benefit from trying to get this perforation closed, provided that, of course, and this is one of the most vexing issues with, with this problem, is that patient, you know, does that patient purely have that chronic draining ear because of water exposure, or is it because of the perforation? Um, you know, there, there are patients who, you know, don't expose the ear to water, who have chronic draining ears in the setting of a perforation, right? And you always ask yourself, is that happening because the perforation exists or does the perforation exist because the patient has chronic eustachian tube issues, chronic infl inflammation of the mucosa, chronic infection that, uh, that would still be there independent of, you know, uh, even if you close the perforation. And that's, that's a question that we always wrestle with. Um, and it's, it's a difficult question to answer. I think the, mo the best way to answer it in many cases is to simply you know, use empiricism. You close the perforation and you see how they do. And sometimes um, that's what we're sort of, uh, that's the decision we're faced with. And you just have a, you know, to me, when I'm faced with that, I have a candid conversation with the patient and say, listen, I, I'm not sure, I'm not, I, I, there's no way I can prove that this is happening because of the perforation, but I think in many cases, um, uh, that is indeed the case, that the perforation itself contributes to the chronic drainage. Um, and that's been my experience uh, because, you know, a lot of these patients, when you close the perforation, especially one like this, that's of this size, you can get that ear to be uh, a dry ear and improve their hearing. Not 100% of the time, but I think that uh, it's probably true most of the time. Would you agree with that, Dr. Mansoor? I think so. I think, uh, you know, the main goal in most of these cases is to achieve a dry, safe ear. That's goal number one. Um, hearing improvement will happen if you successfully improve this and there's no acicular issue. You know, so that's, that's the other thing with endoscopic ear surgery is that when you approach these uh, cases, uh, uh, you will not only uh, plan on, you know, um, closing the perforation, but you will also assess the cicular chain. You will also improve or um, unblock the disventilation, which is happening in some of these years. So I think uh, the top two goals will be to, um, I'm assuming this patient, when they come to you with an audiogram, there is a 40, 30 decibel conductive hearing loss and uh, they're looking for an option to, uh, you know, have a better ear out of the entire experience. So I think, um, uh, you know, those are the main goals and um, that's how um, uh, these cases are approached. Yeah. So um, uh, I'll ask you about your technique. I, you know, I think I know what the answer is going to be for, for all of you, but uh, uh, are you going to use an underlay technique for something like this, Dr. Mansoor? So, um, excellent question. And I think the answer is uh, dependent on your comfort and expertise and what you're used to. 
Um, if you give this picture to a microscope based surgeon who is really, really good with uh, overlay graft and panoplasty, I think that is what they will do and they will be able to achieve great outcomes in most of the cases. Uh, and that is what uh, my experience has been through residency and looking at the literature. Um, so in my hands, uh, I would probably approach this the same way you showed. I would do an endoscopic approach and uh, use a large composite graft um, to, to repair this. Okay. And I, I would do it in an underlay lateral to malleus fashion. Okay, yeah, that's, that's the technique I would use too. Um, what about you, Dr. Cass? Do you feel, do you feel there's any role for a, a lateral graft in that, in that patient? You know, my experiences with lateralization and blunting um, that I've seen in my training are pretty distasteful. And uh, so I think that for me, and, and you know, I, I, I've had a decent experience uh, with lateral grafting in terms of, of volume, but I, uh, you know, it's a significant risk. I think it's a much bigger risk than anything that I'm risking with a medial graft. I would consider a lateral graft, but not until I personally had failed a medial graft. Um, and so in this patient, if I've not operated on them before, uh, this would definitely be a medial graft in my hands. Uh, and it would be an over-under technique or a lateral to malleus technique, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I would also, uh, I would probably did fashion. Um, and I think you cut out there for a second, Dr. Cass. You said you would probably do what? in an endoscopic assisted fashion. Um, and I would, uh, uh, what I like to do here is, is what's called a, uh, when the perforation goes very anterior um, up to the, um, the annulus, I like to do uh, what they call, some people call a bucket handle technique, which is um, pulling the, uh, or, or pull through, which is pulling the graft up um, onto the anterior uh, um, canal, uh, uh, under the annulus. So you can do this a variety of ways, but the endoscope is the, is I think the, the best way to do this, which is making a little tunnel, uh, start two or three millimeters lateral to the anterior drum, make a little tunnel, put a micro right angle in. And then, um, in your graft, you've got a tab that comes off the front, you hook the tab and you pull it through and it just cinches that graft very anteriorly. So you feel very comfortable that you're not going to fail anteriorly. Um, so that's what I, I like to do for any perforation that's very anterior um, up against the annulus. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I think, I think regardless of what technique you are using for, for a perforation like this that extends this far anterior, probably the most important point, um, uh, and this is true regardless of whether you're using an underlay or a lateral graft technique, I think adequate packing at that anterior uh, portion of the drum is critical. So every case that I do like this, the first thing that I'm going to pack is the eustachian tube, actually. I want to fill up that eustachian tube orifice and then sequentially pack from anterior to posterior. And I want to have a nice flat bed of gel foam juxtaposing the undersurface of the anterior tympanic membrane remnant, because I think that's where the grafts are most likely to fail. Um, it's it's something that's actually much easier to do if you have a subtotal perforation like this because you have you know, ready, easy access to that anterior portion of the mesotympanum and the protympanum where the eustachian tube orifice lives. So I want to make sure that that gel foam is, is, um, is stacked up to the level of the anterior annulus so that when I go in to put my graft on top of the gel foam, I can very easily just tuck in the anterior edge of the graft underneath the tympanic membrane remnant and have it be supported underneath by all of that gel foam that I've put in place. Um, and I, fortunately, I've had, I've had good luck with that, but I, I do think that's a, that's a you know, um, uh, a, a piece of minutia that's, that's actually really critical for these repairs. Yeah, and uh, to further your point, Nate, that's, that, and that is an excellent point because most of these failures are gonna happen in that anterior portion, right? The drum is gonna look great posteriorly. And, uh, you know, you'll have a 5-10% perforation anteriorly if you don't pay attention to uh, packing it really well. And uh, the other thing is with endoscopes, you know, that's the other beauty of it, that you can really visualize that area at the end of the operation, right? So if you're not happy with how it's sitting, you can certainly lift up the graphs, put a little bit more gel foam, 
pack it really tightly and then uh, you're happy with that. So I think, um, and, and that works well even in ear canals with a little bit of anterior bulge because you can use an angled endoscope and, and look at that. Yeah. Um, and then the bucket handle technique where, you know, the, you actually um, show, you know, kind of uh, reflect the graft anteriorly. Um, I have done that too. I think it's a little bit more challenging sometimes. Um, but I think if you, uh, if you, um, in fact, the case I did it, I was worried that I have caused some blunting, but that was not the case. <laughs> so, so I think you just have to be careful um, how much, uh, you know, because if you can easily blunt that into your angle, if you are trying to reflect a graph there, uh, and you have to make sure that if you do that, then you have to make sure that you really pack the ear, after you flip everything back down, you have to pack that area in such a way that you still maintain that anterior acute angle. So if you look at traditional lateral grafting, uh, people would cut gel foam in different sizes or cigar shaped sizes, and they'll really tuck that into your angle. So I think, you know, in most cases you can get away by just packing it really well with gel foam. Yeah, but that uh, that pull through technique can it, it is a it is an elegant technique when it's executed uh, well. I think um, if you, if you um, Dr. Cass, I think uh, I think you you cut out for just a moment there. Sorry, um, I think more um, broad uh, uh, elevation, uh, and then one where you start quite far laterally and and you make a very on your graft it's almost like a string so the the disruption to the anterior annulus is less in that case so um but yeah i agree that you're certainly putting yourself at risk for a little bit of blunting but the more dissection you do in that area the more risk you're incurring so uh, i uh dr cass let me just um, i'm going to paraphrase phrase as best i can you correct me if i'm wrong you said you feel like uh, less broad elevation of the anterior canal skin and a thinner uh, tab at the anterior aspect of the graft are ideal for minimizing the risk of blunting? Yeah. Okay, got it. That makes sense. Okay, so let's talk about this one. So, so you have a, a patient like this who comes in and um, uh, let's just sort of skip to the, the, the meat of the, the question. Uh, you've she's made it or this patient has made a decision to have this repaired. Um, I don't remember if this patient, the gender of this patient, um, but this is a perforation that's antero inferior. This is a right ear. Here we have the superior uh, portion of the drum. Here's the malleus, of course, underneath the drum. And you have some, uh, this is inferior. This is the anterior canal bulge and posterior portion of the drum. So you have this perforation that that's anterior to the manubrium does extend a little bit um, into the antero superior quadrant of the drum. I'm curious to know uh, from both of you, is this a case, if you take this to the operating room, this, this patient to the operating room, are you going to elevate this drum off of the manubrium? When do, you, when do you decide to make that decision? What are the pros and cons of doing that in your minds? All right, I'll take it. So I think, um, you know, whenever I see a perf where there is a perforation anterior to the manubrium of malleus, I think in most of these cases, elevating the native drum off the malleus is a good idea uh, because of two reasons. One is, you know, the first rule of surgery is exposure, right? So if you do that, I think it's a very low risk maneuver. Um, you're not typically going to do anything harmful in that way. The second and most important thing is, um, it will allow you, and I love to do lateral to malleus underlay to manoplasty, so it will allow you to, and I love cartilage graft, so it will allow you to tuck your graft lateral to the malleus, uh, that perichondrium slit, and that will really sit well in that area. Whenever I also look at a perforation, I'm also looking at where is the tympanosclerosis, and so if there is any tympanosclerosis around the edge, uh, you have to kind of work a little bit on that, remove it, because uh, um, because of the vascularity. So your graft is not going to get vascularized if you uh, try to oppose a cartilage graft with a thick tympanosclerotic plaque. That's not going to work. I've learned this the hard way. So you will have to uh, make all those maneuvers. But in my opinion, if, um, you know, uh, 
it, let me ask, phrase it this way. Uh, what are the cases where I will not elevate from the maneuver? Well, if it's a posterior uh, perforation or inferior perforation where it, there's no involvement of the maneuver of malleus, that's the case where I won't do it. But in most other cases, and especially a case like this, I would probably elevate it. Yeah, and I, uh, I have similar feelings in terms of anterior perforations. Uh, I think that the, so, so the, the um, manubrial fold where the TM invests into the manubrium of the malleus is a very special um, connection. It's a very special um, uh, piece of connective tissue. And what it allows um, is at higher frequency, at lower frequencies, the malleus acts more as a lever. Uh, but at higher frequencies, uh, the way that the malleus and the manubrial fold um, work together is that the malleus is actually somewhat decoupled from the tympanic membrane uh, in its vibrations, and it, it actually rotates in, in a somewhat elliptical fashion. So I, I don't like to disrupt that relationship if I don't have to. If I'm, if what I'm, if so, and, and the, the, where this comes into uh, play is if you have someone that comes in with a, you know, 20% post. 15, 20% posterior perforation, and they're only really, they have a dry ear, they're only really concerned about hearing, uh, that is someone I'm, I'm certainly going to try to preserve that relationship because that's going to give you the best chance at a, at a home run hearing outcome result. Um, that being said, there are other people in whom the, the main goal is going to be for perforation closure for, um, for chronic drainage. Uh, and in, in those patients, I'm going to be more aggressive in terms of uh, trying to make sure, giving it the very best chance of not, um, of, of being able to close. So I think in similar to Dr. Manzor, I'm going to use cartilage grafting in this particular patient. Uh, so in, to, sum, to summarize, anterior perforation, anterior to the malleus, uh, all, I think you really have to lift the um, drum off the malleus to get good coverage of that perforation, uh, not not aligning that graft too close to the um, to the malleus because then it's the, the 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 thickness of the malleus is actually going to make your graft not opposed to the um, the posterior most portion of the perforation. Um, but if it's inferior or it's posterior and it is not uh, within about one to one and a half millimeters of the malleus, then I would not. Um, lift the um, uh, deglove the malleus. So I'm I'm gonna um, I differ slightly from both of you in in my opinion about this. And but this is that's great because we we don't want anybody think we don't want all of us thinking the same thing about this. That would be no fun. Um, but for a perforation like this, I totally agree with you that um, not lifting the drum off the malleus on a case like this. It's a more difficult operation. It's a it's a more annoying operation, frankly, because the exposure of the anterior part of the mesotympanum is more limited. But I agree with Dr. Cass as well about I I just think that and, and th I think that there's there's not great literature about this. There's a little bit uh, actually. Dr. Mansour, you 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 wrote a, um, a great paper about um, the lack of of um, hearing decrement that uh, patients achieve with a lateral to malleus underlay technique in which the drum is lifted off of the maneuver. Am I correct about that? Are you sure I wrote that? <laughs> I, I may have, um, but, um, you know, I, I think the way I think about this is that this kind of a perforation, um, you know, even in cases where I have totally degloved the maleuses, right? So there are two points here. I agree with your points about hearing. Uh, issues, but those may be a little bit more theoretical because I definitely know of cases of myself, of, of Alejandro Rivas, where totally degloved malleus and there is no airborne gap anymore, right? Yeah, after sure. after healing. So sure. uh, I guess the, 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 uh, for the audience, the ultimate point is that we all um, have a preference of using different reconstructive material. And I guess the literature tells us that irrespective of what we use and how we do it, if we don't cause lateralization, if we don't cause blunting, there is no overwhelming difference between what kind or what type and what type of graft you use for your tympanoplasties. You know, I mean, of course that's on average. So we all will have cases where we'll run, we'll have home runs and there'll be no issues. 
but then we will have some cases where you know everything will look beautiful and there will be still some hearing loss and then you kind of kind of scratch your head a little bit about it but um but one thing i'll tell you is that degloving the so this is my personal thing is that for this kind of perforation i'll elevate it off the malleus but i wouldn't totally deglove the malleus meaning i'll still keep the cartilage cap intact and i'll just elevate it enough superiorly that i can tuck my graft underneath it but I will not make an interior cut or totally deglove the malleus. So oh, that's, that's malleus a point. So you're saying, are you saying that you would lift the drum off the manubrium but leave it attached at the umbo? Is that what you're saying? Leave leave it attached to the lateral process. To the, oh, I so you would elevate it from inferior to superior. Yes. Yeah. So I think once you are elevating posteriorly, if you incise and get on that uh, superiosteal plane on the malleus, then you can still keep the superior drum attached to the lateral process of malleus, you don't have to remove it in this case because your perforation doesn't reach that up high. But if you have a larger anterior perforation going much, much more superiorly, you know, the first principle would be to make sure your graft is covering the entire perforation, right? So by a, by a good margin, because you, you would hate to see this patient three months after surgery and there's like a 10% superior anterior perforation yeah, because yeah. your graft was short. But I think for this particular example, I would think that if you elevate it just from the manubrium and leave it attached superiorly, you will still be able to repair it without totally decloving the malleus. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you about that point. Um, I, I, I do think that the, you know, and, and I don't I'll readily admit, I just, I just think that the literature on this topic is not very robust, but I think that as Dr. Cass decoupled, as Dr. Cass said, decoupling the drum from that tight sort of um, layer of soft tissue that envelops the manubrium, uh, I, I'm convinced that that has some impact on perhaps more so the high frequency hearing than the low frequency hearing. That's, that's what I've seen because, uh, you know, and I think that's probably supported by, you know, some of the literature that we've seen on total drum replacements being associated with a high frequency conductive loss that's perhaps not captured in the, you know, um, the typical way of reporting outcomes. You know, we, we, when we report our outcomes on tympanoplasty, we're usually re reporting outcomes at 500, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 hertz. And we're not capturing that high frequency hearing that probably has some impact on a patient's experience of hearing, even if those frequencies are not within the speech range. Um, so, you know, with that, I, I, but I also, I will say that for an anter a perforation that really extends far into the antero superior quadrant of the drum, I will, I will not hesitate to lift the drum up off the malleus in that situation, because I think the perforations that extend um, uh, into the antero superior quadrant or that, you know, uh, or where the drum is, is just not healthy in that area, then, you know, I'll go ahead and remove the disease drum or uh, just, just uh, bite the bullet and lift the drum off the malleus so that I can uh, make sure that I have complete control over that antero superior portion of the mesotympanum, pack it tightly and, um, and get a good reconstruction. And that has served me well. So in this case, um, I use an endoscopic underlay technique, um, which we, we've just talked about. I, this was back when I was using a lot of bio design. I've actually, I like bio design. I don't, I, I've shifted away from it personally a little bit. I, I, I use, you know, probably 97% of the time, 90, 98% of the times I use cart cartilage and perichondrium. And I left the drum attached to the manubrium in this instance, and this was a pre-op and post-op, and this was just four, four weeks post-op. So, you know, you can still see the sort of tight adherence between the drum and the malleus here, and um, that was her outcome. Not a perfect outcome, but definite improvement in her thresholds. Okay, so now we're going to, those, those are some, I think that that's some good, you know, bread and butter chronic here. Um, I think we got some questions that came in. I want to make sure that we get to those before we move on to some of the miscellaneous topics we're going to talk about. Um, so this is a question. Uh, how often do you get cholesteatoma pearls when lifting the TM from the malleus? Dr. Cass, you want to talk about that? Yeah, I think that uh, if you, this is, this, is, this is a tricky thing to do, I think, um, when you're starting out. It's not, it doesn't come easy. And 
uh, you have to be very, very detail oriented, um, especially on the anterior surface. Um, so this is something that uh, I think this, this maneuver probably takes me longer than um, any, any other exposure maneuver um, in a tympanoplasty uh, because I, I fear that same thing about uh, causing an iatrogenic, um, you know, intra, um, intra tympanic membrane cholesteatoma. Um, so I think that just, uh, uh, taking it very slowly, um, really getting, uh, if you're going to, if you're going to deglove it the way we were talking about earlier, where you're totally taking it off the malleus, um, coming under the, um, small piece of cartilage on the lateral process helps you get into that plane directly on the bone of the malleus. And I think if you, you're much more likely to tear the uh, tympanic membrane if you don't get into that correct plane. Um, and uh, yeah, if, if, if you're out of the plane, I mean, you have a high, I say you have a very high chance of um, leaving some skin on the anterior portion of that malleus. And that's gonna, that's gonna result in some form of um, intratympanic membrane pearl at best. So I think you, you know, I obviously completely agree with that point. You, you have to be careful, uh, but if you do it properly and execute it properly and you're visualizing it clearly, I think the chances of developing an iatrogenic cholesterotoma is low. Um, that is what is supported by, you know, the literature, people who do enough of endoscopic ear surgery uh, will attest to that. Um, the, the other question I was just looking at it is that, um, so two things, I use a sickle knife and once you go underneath, uh, once you, you know, elevate that cap, you're in the right plane. And then the direction of the dissection should be in the long axis of malleus. So you're minimizing any anterior posterior force on the malleus. And, uh, and, you know, once you start doing it, once you get enough practice with it, 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 it is, uh, it is something which, uh, uh, you know, at first it's very, your heart rate is high because you, you know that something can happen. But once you do enough of this, uh, uh, you realize that once you get in that plane, it's very easy. Some people also, once they get in that plane would take a cup forceps and just totally hold that tissue with the cup forceps and, and, and go in fairly directly. Um, I personally just would use the sickle knife throughout and throughout till, uh, till that is degloved. Yeah. I do think that, you know, uh, in general with endoscopic ear surgery, you end up finding yourself using um, cups and alligators in situations where you might otherwise favor using a, a suction and a dissecting instrument uh, with a microscope. But don't you think that's true? I mean, I, I know a lot of people, for example, when they're lifting up the drum and they arrive to the posterior superior quadrant and the mesotympanum, they'll, they'll sort of take an alligator and pull that soft tissue under the posterior superior portion of the drum, that, that, um, that uh, malleur uh, fold and, and pull it anteriorly to expose the underlying chorda tympani. Uh, so the, uh, you end up finding uh, different ways of using your instruments that facilitate the endoscopic technique. Um, I agree with uh, Dr. Uh, Mansoor. I, I personally, I like a sickle, but I also like uh, the 45 degree angled uh, Rivas elevator for this, the suction elevator. I think that uh, I find myself using that in certain, in certain situations like a Rosen, you know, but it of course has the added advantage of suctioning. So if it's a, if it's a particularly bloody ear, then I'll end up using that instrument. But if it's a, a, a dry ear, then I'll use a sickle as well. The other thing, I, th I think that uh, you're, sometimes you end up using some of those cut forceps because you've given up a lot of your counter tension with the lack of suction. And so some of those dissecting instruments just don't work as well um, when you have no counter tension. Um, and so I think that's why you're, you're almost forced to use some of these instruments in ways they weren't really intended to be used initially, but people have really found ways to get around that lack of counter tension um, and try to mitigate the disadvantages of using an endoscope. While we are on this point, let me ask you guys a question. So yeah. do you guys ever divide your flap? Like when you're elevating a flap, would you ever like in a, in a tighter situation, if the ear canal is smaller. So for example, if the perforation, and I, I know you guys can't see my pointer, but let's say there's an anterior perforation, right? And it's, it's the same perforation you showed in the last example, right? And you're elevating 
and you've elevated off. So instead of elevating the entire drum in, in one huge plane, once you elevate the analyst, do you sometimes divide the flap like through the analyst and just have two leaflets? Um, so I, I, I started doing that in some cases. And um, so exactly the case you showed, um, it really is, it makes it very easy. The, the only point is that uh, there are some other surgeons who uh, were frowned upon this idea and they're like, this is not good. But uh, you know, if our goal is to have a completely repaired eardrum and hearing improvement, then I think you know, in my hand, sometimes I would do that too just because it just makes it so much easier and you don't have to elevate it you know, in more areas. Because if you cut down in the middle and you just reach your target, then you have two leaflets and you elevate them off in both places. You put your graphs in and you put everything back down together. The only caveat is that you have cut through the annulus, but I don't think it really matters. Um, but I don't think there's any study which shows you one way or another. Um, but I feel like that's a good trick sometimes because I've, I've learned that from Rivas. Sometimes uh, if you are struggling and you just can't see, uh, that is a good trick sometimes. Now, where do you end up uh, making that, that cut? So if you make your tympanometer flap, so you know, imagine if you've made your flap and everything is elevated up till the level of the annulus. And then you just visualize where your perforation is and you take a micro scissor and just cut your flap including the analyst, including the native drum towards that perforation. So essentially you, instead of a sheet, now you have two leaflets and you can, you have a superiorly based leaflet and an inferiorly based leaflet. And the, the, that makes it super easy sometimes because then you can keep elevating the analyst inferiorly and park that leaflet away from you. And then, then as you flip the superior leaflet out of the way, you're right at the malleus. And those are the cases where I would not totally deglove the malleus. I would just get on the manubrium, lift a little bit of the drum from the manubrium and the umbo so I can slide my graft above the malleus. And then I flip everything back down together. So yeah. I think, uh, you know, it, the, the jury's out there, but I think, you know, I know Jake, uh, Jake Hunter, other people who do this, they, they don't like it sometimes, but I think it can be useful sometimes uh, if you are struggling. Yeah, I personally, I don't, I don't use that technique. I have before, but I, I, um, I don't know. I just, I, I think for me, I, 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 I like the comfort and security of having an intact flap. And I know that this is the common argument against that. And, uh, but I also readily admit, just like you did, there's no good evidence for or against it. Right. But um, I, I, value having a nice broad large tympanometal flap that i can set down at the end of the case and be confident that the you know the epithelium is still healthy and it's going to help to re-epithelialize that graft but it's it's a it's it's an interesting proposition i i don't you know i i'm not i'm not so sure that there is a disadvantage to it really i mean I, at the end of the day, you're 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 replacing the epithelium on top of the graft, and as, I think as long as you have good contact with the underlying soft tissue, uh, you're probably in good shape. Yeah, I, uh, I I've done that before, Naman, uh, and I I agree. I don't I haven't seen any difference in outcomes postoperatively. I haven't necessarily thought of it honestly as. Um, as decreasing the amount of exposure you have to get, but but now that you say that, it makes sense. Um, I, I've I've done it and seen it done uh, primarily when the flap is so unwieldy for the for the ear canal, kind of like you were talking about, where you where you kind of have a more direct route. Um, the one thing I'll say is that, uh, uh, well, two things. One, I think. I think it's hard to take the drum off the malleus when you don't come from the very top. Um, but I have a lot to learn in that regard. I know. So I'll, uh, I'll let you know in, uh, in a year or two, what I think of that from taking off from, from the bottom up, but I, I see what you mean. Um, the other thing I'll say is that, uh, <laughs> when you do this, I think that you have to, uh, you have to be. You have to have a very good under three dimensional understanding of exactly where your flaps are, because it's a little easy to get lost when you've divided the flap, um, and so you just have to make sure you know um, how big each flap is, how big each leaflet is, 
and what the direction is and where you put them. Because when you're trying to reconstruct everything afterwards, it can be challenging to, to try to figure out what goes where. But if you have a good understanding of that all and your field isn't um, you know, too bloody and, and you, you know, that's, I agree. It's a much more direct route. I, and I don't think there's any significant difference in post-operative healing from what I've seen. All right, let's move on to some, some, uh, fun stuff. So, uh, this, this patient came to see me with a right middle ear mass, uh, had a resection of a facial nerve schwannoma decades ago and a complete right facial palsy that preceded uh, the operation that he had preceded the operation. So it was there before he had surgery has been longstanding, doesn't want anything done about his facial palsy. And he has a tremendous conductive hearing loss. So this uh, patient came in with this audiogram. So you see a dramatic uh, primarily conductive hearing loss on the right, some maximal hearing, maximal conductive hearing loss. And on the left, he's got reasonably good hearing. Um, so I'll just tell you now, here's, here's the MRI. So on the left-hand side is a coronal T1 contrasted MRI. Uh, and you see this lesion here. Um, this is the right uh, ear, right middle ear. There's a sort of the, this dark, uh, this hypo attenuated signal uh, right through the middle of this area of contrast. And then here's a T2 weighted image on the right. This is an axial T2 weighted image. This is a Fiesta scan. Or, um, and, and so what you have here is this, is this is the cochlea. Here's the internal auditory canal and the cranial nerves within it, the vestibule. And then there's this T2 hyper intense area anterior to the vestibule. It's a little funny. You, know, you don't really expect to see that there. Um, so that's all I'm gonna give you for the moment. Uh, but I want to know what your thoughts are. This patient wants improvement in his hearing. Uh, so that's, that's the patient's primary goal. What are you thinking about? What's, what, what do you think you're gonna offer this patient? What's going through your head? Maybe let's start with Dr. Mansoor. Um, so Kareem, one question is on the CT. Uh, you had a CT scan, right? I did not get a CT yeah. scan on okay. this channel. Oh, okay. yeah. Um, so, you know, the first question I have is like, uh, you know, just, and do you have any prior audiograms? Like what was his hearing? No, he had been lost to follow up follow for up. a very okay. long time. Yeah. yeah. So that, uh, that middle, you know, you, on exam, you have a middle ear mass. On scan, you have a contrasted lesion. It's a little bit atypical on T2. So the one thing you will think is like, is this a recurrent facial nerve schwannoma? Um, but the T2 signal is, is throwing you off because that's not how schwannomas look like. Um, but, um, you know, so one thing would be like, uh, you know, in his initial surgery, maybe he had um, unclear margins from neuroma and there's a recurrent or regrowth of that. And that is somehow pushing his ossicles or, uh, you know, giving him conductive hearing loss. I think if you... Um, the way if I had a, you know, if you have a CT scan, you can probably look at the vesicular anatomy in a little bit more detail. Uh, but you have an MRI here, it's showing you there is a middle ear mass. Um, he has a pretty significant conductive hearing loss. So I think um, there are two things here. One is um, there is a recurrent middle ear mass. And uh, with his history, one option is that uh, you offer him middle ear exploration and Kind of, uh, kind of figure out what this is and if this can be removed and what is the status of his acicular chain. And I think where the so location- would you, would you offer that with an endoscopic approach or would you, what do you think? I, I think, uh, you know, based on the location, it's still in the middle ear compartment. So, and it's not going into the mastoid, there's no deeper uh, or IAC involvement. Um, so I think uh, an endoscopic exploration is probably more reasonable. Dr. Cass, what goes through your mind? Yeah, I uh, I agree. I think that um, you know this is a this you're, you're gonna. I mean, this is me. I have my microscope in the room. I've got my endoscope in the room. Um, I probably will end up using both on this case, but I think you you, you just 
if you don't have a CT scan, you're not exactly sure of the mastoid involvement, you say, we're going to, you know, let's do surgery. Let's try to see what, what's going on. This is going to be the, the goals of surgery are going to be one diagnosis, um, two, uh, attempted, um, hearing improvement. So, you know, you just go in and you, you lift up the eardrum and you see what it looks like. And then you, um, decide how far it goes and, and, uh, you use your endoscopes and see if you need to, um, uh, to go posterior in the mastoid, but, you know, you can, you can use those in conjunction. You can do some atacotomy and use your endoscope with, you know, do an atacotomy and, and endoscope, you know, endoscopic, uh, approach is not in, in, you know, mutually exclusive with atacotomy. You know, you, you get even more, um, using your endoscope with an atacotomy than you get using your microscope with an atacotomy. So I think that yeah, I agree. I agree with that. That's an excellent point. Yeah. That's an excellent point. Um, Okay, well, so it sounds like both of you, I mean, at the very least, not, none of you thinks that it's unreasonable to start with an endoscope at the very least, but it sounds, I'm, what I'm hearing is maybe it's, it's a good idea to be prepared to convert to a microscopic technique, perhaps. So, Kareem, couple, uh, one more point. So before, yeah. before you start. No, bring so it on. For the audience. So of course, you know, if, if he's asking for hearing improvement, there are other options too, right? So one is you put a hearing aid in that ear, the other is he can, he will be a great candidate for bone anchored hearing aid if he chooses to do that. And the other thing is if this is a 10 year long standing facial paralysis complete, uh, his motor end plates are dead on that side. So there is no, um, so I think the only question in my mind, if this is like a de novo facial nerve schwannoma where someone has house Brackman four and I'm attempting to do a cable graph or something, then yes, uh, I'm, most likely going to need a microscope to be able to find the nerve in the descending segment, things like that. But this is a long-standing paralysis, so I don't think there will be any primary facial nerve, um, you know, cable grafting here. Um, so that is another point which will probably tell me to do this endoscopically and and. That's a really critical point. Yeah. No, absolutely. So, so in this patient, you know, we uh, his, his my assumption is that the way that the schwannoma was detected was that he presented decades ago with facial palsy and that um, at some point progressed to complete paralysis. So he had had complete paralysis since before his first operation. So yes, I absolutely agree with you. Don't, we, the, um, reconstruction was a brief or reanimation surgery, facial reanimation surgery was a brief conversation. He had long ago decided that that was uh, an endeavor he was not interested in. And other physicians, other uh, otolaryngologists had had those conversations with him and he had decided that he was fine with his, uh, with his ipsilateral facial palsy. So we did, we did talk about um, the alternatives, of course. So we talked about hearing aid. Uh, and I don't remember if this gentleman had tried a hearing aid or not, um, but uh, we talked about bone conduction devices too, and we talked about just going in and uh, trying to tackle this, take out this mass, and reconstruct him. So I'll show you the video. Um, we'll get to the punchline now, but that's an awesome point. So I'll kind of I'll narrate through this. So here we are. We've lifted up the drum, and you see this fleshy mass just underneath the drum. And now I'm separating that mass from the stapes, which is right here. That's the stapes capitulum, removing what we've, you know, essentially confirmed to be a recurrent facial nerve schwannoma. It has the appearance of a schwannoma. There were kind of two components, one superior to the stapes, one inferior. Here's the, the remnant corda coming out with the tumor. There was no way I, in my hands anyway, that I was gonna preserve the corda. And so I removed the tumor in this case, I'm going to pause it because this is a really critical point. This thing was so erosive um, the the vestibule appeared to be eroded. And what I didn't show you, uh, unfortunately, is that that T2 a hyper intense signal ended up representing basically a meningocele. So this 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 gentleman had had a trans lab, and so it had you know wide decompression of his dura. Uh, including the dura of the tegmen tympani, uh, the, that, that is usually superior to the tegmen tympani. And so you put your endoscope in there and there's this just bluish hue uh, and the tumor was right up against that dura. So we separated the tumor 
And as I was exploring um, uh, his uh, facial nerve canal, as I said, that was dehiscent. And it looked to me like the foot plate was also dehiscent. Um, so what I ended up doing was I harvested a, a tragal perichondrium and cartilage, and I decided to put in a torp. And here I am putting the cartilage over the torp. I've packed the gel foam around the torp. Cartilage is in place now. We did a wide atacotomy to achieve the necessary posterior superior exposure and the epitympanic exposure. And then we, um, we reflected the drum back. And this uh, gentleman fortunately had a really nice outcome. This is his audiogram. Uh, that was his. Uh, that was his post-operative appearance. Unfortunately, it's a little bit hazy, but you can see this is the right drum. Here's the manubrium. This is anterior. Here's the cartilage cap over the torp, and you can see that, we, that here's the wide atacotomy. Usually, you wouldn't be able to see this much of the. Um, uh, the, the this area would not be uh, would not be. Uh, well, this would be bone rather than drum, but this is the bone that we've removed. And we put in the cartilage cap over the torp, and here's his uh, result. So I thought for a torp, this is pretty good. His PTA improved from 72 to 18, and he was really pleased with this outcome, as was I, of course. I was it was a happy happy moment for him. But that's uh, that's what we did for that case. But uh, okay, now let's go back to some chronic ear stuff. So uh, this is, I think, a, like an age-old question, and this uh, we'll have to kind of speed through this because we're almost done. But uh, this is a left ear, and we have a pars flaccida cholesteatoma here. This is the manubrium, anterior, posterior drum, inferior here. I'm just going to ask you, Numan, for something like this, would you commit the patient to an atacotomy or mastoidectomy? Do you use imaging to sort of inform your decision-making about how to plan for surgery. And I'll ask Dr. Cass the same question. Yeah, yes to imaging because the, these cholesterol can be very deceiving. Um, so you want to have a good um, idea of what you're dealing with before you commit to it. Imaging will tell you the posterior extent of it too. Um, so for example, um, if you obviously see cholesterol and the mastoid, then you're gonna be approaching it through a hybrid approach. Um, the other thing is uh, imaging is great because uh, you can assess, you know, there's a, obviously, you know, tegmin in this area, there's facial nerve deep to it. Uh, you want to know good, you know, you want to have a good idea of what you're dealing with uh, before you, uh, before you start the surgery. Um, if there is no cholesterol extending into the mastoid uh, or around the dome of the lateral canal, then I would probably approach this through the endoscopic corridor. Um, I'm ready to do an atacotomy and, and see if uh, that's the way we we're going to do it. Sometimes these are gnarly, and uh, if they extend really back and the matrix is stuck to it, then uh, you're going to have to do a mastoidectomy and be two-handed um, in some of the cases. Yeah. Yeah. I. Uh, <clears throat> so I guess first I would say um, I would try to clean this better in clinic and get a better understanding of what of of how deep that pocket is. I'm also a big fan of using endoscopes in clinic and even 30, 45 degree angle endoscopes in clinic, um, because I think that that can really help inform decision-making and counseling. Uh, and I think if, if there's something that I can't see the depths of the pocket, if I have the endoscope in the perfect position and I can't, like I can see the endoscope extending even farther up um, by, the lateral, by the horizontal canal, then that's, I think this is a really helpful um, time saver uh, because I think it can help you uh, right when you start the case, you know, you know, I'm gonna go post auricular mastodectomy. Um, and I think that frankly, I think a really good clinic endoscopic exam is as good or better than imaging because imaging, if I get a, a CT scan and the mastoid is a pacified, it doesn't really tell me necessarily, unless I see erosion. If I see erosion of the air cells, it tells me, but if I see an opacified antrum with, with normal air cells that are opacified in the mastoid, it doesn't tell me if it's post-obstructive um, uh, you know, fluid or um, uh, you know, thickened mucosa versus cholesterol that's yeah. in the additus or in the antrum. 
and uh, just hasn't eroded the the um, air cell system. So I think imaging, you don't have to get imaging for these and cream, I know you don't typically, but um, I, I will. Uh, I like to know if there's any curve balls. We're, you know, is, is the facial nerve going to be a normal position? Almost certainly. You know, is the horizontal canal going to be eroded? Maybe, maybe not. You'll figure it out intraoperatively. I just like to know that ahead of time. So I'm probably going to get CTs for all these patients. No, I think, I, I mean, I do not think that it is wrong to obtain CT scans. I, I think as a general rule, my approach to these cases is if there's a cholesteatoma there, especially, um, then I'm going to approach the case with the assumption that anything and everything that could be wrong with this case is wrong. <laughs> and so because of that, I, you know, I feel that um, CT doesn't, uh, doesn't change the way that I pr approach these cases. So, and, and we've all seen cases that where the CT m misleads you um, in some way and cases where perhaps the CT is just a few months old and um, something has changed between the time of the scan and the time of the operation. Um, you know, that can mean uh, what was um, a, a non-dehiscent tympanic segment on the first scan might now be a dehiscent tympanic segment of the facial nerve. Um, where there was not a horizontal semicircular canal fistula on the, on the scan, there now is in the operating room, right? So things evolve with these cases. It's a progressive uh, condition. But the main reason is that I think if I'm, if I'm going to do, if I know that I'm going to do a mastoidectomy, then I'm going to be prepared, regardless of what the scan shows, or the, for a dehiscent nerve, a lateral semicircular canal fistula, um, a fistula of some other portion of the inner ear. And, and that's the way I'm going to tread. That's, that's how I'm going to tread through the case. I'm going to assume that those things are there so that I can just be safe. Um, that, that's, that's my reasoning. But I do not think that it is wrong at all to obtain CT imaging. And I, I know that probably most of my partners would obtain CT imaging for a case like this. All right. I thought, well, I, we we're at 4.03. I think uh, we should probably wrap this up. I am so appreciative to both of you, Dr. Cass and Dr. Manzor for joining us. I think this was an awesome panel. I hope that uh, our attendees have really enjoyed this course. We value your feedback very much. So you're, you're going to receive some surveys asking you how, how you liked the course. Please uh, tell us what we did well, tell us what could be better uh, for next time. We um, really value your input. We are grateful to you for attending. Uh, happy that we could put on this course uh, for free with the support of our um, industry sponsors and the institution. I have to give a big thank you to Megan Franklin, to Nate Cast, to uh, Nate Lindquist, um, Dr. Perkins, Dr. Bennett, all of our speakers, um, Dr. Marchioni, um, Dr. Cosetti, Aquinell. Um, I'm forgetting a lot of people, but there are so many people to thank for this. I just want to uh, just want to thank everybody right now because they all deserve uh, they all deserve it. Uh, they were completely uh, uh, generous with their time, and I'm so appreciative to everybody for the help. So thank you for joining us, and with that, we'll conclude this year's Vanderbilt Endoscopic Middle Ear Surgery course. We'll see you next time. All right. Take care, Kareem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.